recording. Um, here's how it's going to go, Mr. Two okay. Show Wednesday. Um, Wednesday. Thursday. I, oh, Thursday. Wait, why do you have two shows today? Is that how they of, do it in LA? No, because of July 4th. Oh, people, people listening, now you know where we are in place and time. So it's July 6th, 2023. I am in Brooklyn, New York. Gavin Creel is where? In Los Feliz, Los Feliz, California, Los Angeles. I love Los Feliz. Are you in a sublet? Do you have a home in Los Feliz uh, that I don't know about? I know. God, I wish. I, I have the most beautiful Airbnb that I found at the beginning of this tour. And we are in our, this is our last stop. I booked all my housing the entire tour while we were sitting in the sits probe of uh, Buffalo in freezing cold in February. And Do you I want to tell the folks at home what tour we're talking about? Oh, I'm on Into the Woods. We, we did a 10 city limited engagement. Um, they told us not to call it a tour, but it's a tour. But it was the closing cast of the Broadway company for kind of unusually so just got on the road and we all left town and did 10 cities across the country to share this this beautiful show that we were so lucky to have done um, across the country. It started for, it was supposed to be 10 days of rehearsal and 10 days of performances at the city center. And then it just sort of caught on. And after that, mm -hmm. we went for two months on New York in New York and then got a new cast and went on for another six months. And now we've been on the road for six months. So it's been- And now I'm talking to you in 2045. And- <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Wherever you are on the planet, listener, uh, it's not really 2045. But the point is, you booked yourself instead of like sad hotel rooms, Oof. Airbnbs. I'm one of the I'm, I'm lucky one. I've been doing this business for 25 years. Oh, geez. 27 years. And I just decided my priority was not going to be maybe going out and to eat all the time. It was I'd rather spend my money on living in a beautiful place. So this last place has been so beautiful. Oh my God, yeah. well, what a way to end this leg of the not tour. Um, <laughs> I'm just curious, like, because people listening, some are in the Broadway space, either performers or just lovers of Broadway. And some people are like, what's this podcast? Yeah, and they just hopped into whatever this is, 390 I episodes. Like, why do you think producers were sensitive to the fact that they would rather not call it a tour? Like, what do you think the... The Good nuance gosh. of that is. Well, I think they wanted to just be clear that um, with this particular show, this specific situation, we were not, um, you know, a lot of times you'll, if you're lucky, you have a big success on Broadway in a musical or a play, especially musicals. And while that's running, they'll send a national tour out of all different people because they want to keep all the people on Broadway performing right. that. So you'll cast new people. But what's exciting sometimes is the people who originate the roles or create it from the beginning. You know, I know I'm excited like, oh, that person's leaving. I want to see before they leave because they're the one who made the role or they originated this revival or whatever. Right, right. Um, and our show is a little unique because the beginning people were only in concert and then a few of them couldn't go on to the Broadway two month run because they had TV jobs or whatever. So then we brought in people like Brian Darcy James and and Philip Basu and and Patina Miller and 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 Joshua Henry and more and more, and then they couldn't go on to the tour. But we had Stephanie Block and Sebastian Arcelis and Montego Glover and Katie Garrity and this amazing plus all of those of us who continued on. Right. They wanted to differentiate just to to show what you're coming to the theater to see. While national tours are incredible and the cast of those shows are incredible, this isn't. We don't have another show running. This right. is the show that was running You're, on Broadway. This is it. This is kind of, it. Yeah, it's kind of a neat thing. Am I peaking? I just realized I might be peaking. Can I tell you what's hilarious? And listeners what? at home, you will appreciate this. So I've had a bit of a day because oh. I sent my dog to get groomed, as you do. And they called me and they said, we are so sorry. You have to come get Lola right away. It reminded me of like when you send your kid to school and they're like, your kid has lice. Um, my dog <laughs> does not have lice, okay. but she had three ticks on her. No. Now, 
I have been in a little, I know I'm going to read your bio in a minute. I know you were in American Horror Story, the Ryan Murphy series, but I oh, am living uh, the American Horror Story with oh. um, ticks. And I thought I'd gotten them all off of her. And I have been really dealing with like um, ticks for weeks now because I was on you know, in Ireland, I was in the Catskills, I was in New Jersey, and they're everywhere. So because of that, I was in a rush to get back to you. I'm not sitting where I usually do my podcast in my studio. And I realized, uh, as a professional podcaster, when you ask if you're peaking, I'm not even using my mic. I'm oh, literally gosh. talking to you through the computer. <laughs> I'm assuming the settings are going to pick up my voice. Um, but I've been so... Well, thank you, honey. You sound great to me. Okay. Uh, so, so I am so peeking in the world of uh, uh, ticks. Um, yeah, can we talk about ticks for a second? Sure, because, because they're I've taking had, over. I, they are, and I have um, had ticks when, when my dog was still living. I had ticks. I would, I would always, whenever we would come in from outside, I'd. He was so good. He'd lay down. He let me. you. Wow. He'd put up his arms, and I'd fix between his paws and. And, and I remember them. being, I remember being in the city once and I was on the subway after I was in the country and I was like, Oh, I have an itch on my back. And I reached down there and there's a tick crawling across my lower back. And I'm like, yeah. Oh dear God, I've seen them on my arms. I went to bed and I saw one burrowing into my leg and I was like, I know, I know. And what's Everybody's funny when you say, wait, wait, I feel like I watched so many interviews with you. Was your dog Wally? What was your dog's Wally, name? Yeah, yes, so because yeah. I watched, I think in the last week, because I didn't <laughs> want this to be repetitive. I don't know, a hundred interviews that you've done. Oh, um, God, and in one of that. them, are you kidding? In one of them, <laughs> your sweet dog, you were in London and your sweet dog was um, by your feet uh, oh. uh, while you were talking to someone who maybe you had done uh, Mormon, Mormon within that. Broadway yes yes, yes. in Patrick, in London yes who was so adorable and you guys had such an incredible conversation I encourage people to go find that one too because oh. this is about ticks and that this one is, is actually about more. Gavin's <laughs> yeah it's so incredible to talk about things I love that hey, thank you for for watching or reading or studying but like I love when we talk about unusual things because it's it's always where that more interesting stuff comes, I think, anyway. Well, I love that Wally like sweetly lay down and let you, because Lola, who I basically gave birth to, right? Like <laughs> there's my children and my dog and it feels exactly the same, will bite me. She actually will oh. try to bite me because she's so, I'm like, I gave birth to you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my little known fact. What, is that there? what is <laughs> I gave birth to my dog, she's a shit too. Oh, she's a lady. rescue so so you know that's mostly what she is I've never done like a 23 and me about my dog but <laughs> I want to get back to you for a second I'm going to read a super truncated bio just okay. um because I want to and and then there are some things I really want to talk to you about on this bio and then um we'll go back to ticks so okay <laughs> everybody my guest today and we're you know three hours into this thing, is the Tony and Olivia, Olivier award-winning artist, Gavin Creel. Uh, Gavin's Broadway credits include Into the Woods, Hello Dolly, Waitress Hair, Mary Poppins, Thoroughly Modern Millie, La Caja Fall. Was that also on Broadway? That was, that was on Broadway, yeah. That was on Broadway. Mary and Poppins. so many more. Mary, Mary Poppins. Poppins. I only did that in the West End. Just to Okay. Go. So the Broadway of England. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh Book of Mormon, as we noted just a moment ago, um, he can be seen in American Horror Stories and one of my favorite web series, Submissions Only. And, Wait, and no, I wasn't. I wasn't in Submissions Only. You weren't. It no, says on. It says on uh, IMDb. I'm so honored to be Miss. Credited. Guess what? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. I love that. I you're love on submissions, submissions only. only um, yes, and that's from this moment on. Actually, you're the star. Uh, I'm the star. It, I am yeah. Mr. Submission. <laughs> you so thought it was Andrew Keenan Bolger, but alas, it's Gavin Creel. Oh, um, but also, I know, what a sweetheart. I also want to talk to you about this incredible piece that you have written um, called Walk On Through. And in sort of learning more about that, you're going to be performing it in New York City in 2023, yes. um, and then all over the globe. Um, so, so yes. I met Gavin 
as a fan at first. And then we sat at Beanie Feldstein's wedding together Thank God a couple you. of weeks ago. Yes, thank God for you. I was like, I don't know anybody here. And I was by myself and I sat down and you were the kindest, most open, hilarious. We had best, fun. Best dinner companion I could have had. I was so, so happy to have gotten to visit with you and meet you. Well, I have been hearing about you from Beanie. And then our dear friend, Jeffrey Knopf actually played me a demo that you had done for him of the musical that he's writing with Jonathan. So, uh, so you were in my, and, and it's all because Donna Murphy couldn't come to that wedding. So suddenly I, I moved over one slot at the table uh, and, uh, and I pretended to be Donna Murphy for one night. I was Fosca <laughs> at the wedding. There you um, go. Gavin, you are such a unicorn. Like the idea that you can do all the things that you do with the most, and by the way, when I tell you, I mean, people who are, are close to me know like funny is very important to me on my list of things that I just fall in love with about people. You could be like the most bizarre person in terms of appearance, but if you're funny, I'm yours. Like mm. I will date you, I will, it doesn't matter. I will love, I love you. That. You are, aside from being like the greatest singer on the planet and the most beautiful actor who works with such specificity, you're so funny. And, that, and like, my God. That is such kind and high praise. I have to tell you, that means a lot to me because I never considered myself that actor or that person. I always thought, I always thought like my, my two heroes, I always say in every interview is, yeah. Christian Laurel and, and, and Chris Fitzgerald are, are two people I watch on the musical theater stage and I just kind of marvel at what they can do. Yeah. Who are my, my contemporaries. But um, I really appreciate saying that. I've been experimenting with it more and more lately. especially Like as a people, person or in no, your on work? On stage, in, yeah. in my work. But what about in uh, life? Where people well, like I, Gavin is hilarious. Like he's my funny know. friend. I don't know that they would think I was that person. I think they would say goofy, aloof, not aloof, um, scattered, goofy, yeah. like a jokester, but maybe a bit of a clown. But I've been really stepping into it more at work in a way that I'm really excited about. I, I have to thank Casey Nicola um, for casting me in Book of Mormon um, because that was kind of one of those moments where I remember seeing Andrew Randalls, who's one of my dear friends, originate mm -hmm. that role and I was like I could never do what he's doing I have no idea how to do that and it was a really intimate comedy is intimidating you know it's well also if you if you guys people know from his episode he actually tried to make it that no one could do it after him but by placing it please, and I hate him for it I mean yes. I had such trauma and yes. I did that show for three and a half years and it was like, and you're still recovering yeah I, mean, I, try, I have PTSD from singing I believe every night over and over yeah again. but and my i did it a half step down from him they dropped it a half step for me so there's like andrew's key and there's gavin's key and i always say everybody don't do andrew's key do yeah my key. yeah but, um so i just appreciate that it's very kind and, and i'm always trying to now when i get sides for some horrible soulless self tape that we have to do or or for an audition for a show yeah. or whatever i always try to look at it and go is there something funny in here? That's, you know, I, mean, I know you're the same way, but it's like, what is that thing? Where is it? Yeah. yeah. Where is it? And sometimes it's not there, but you, you kind of can bring your own funny to something and make it funny. And okay. But Gavin, I saw you uh, not on tour uh, on Broadway, <laughs> which is the same exact thing that people are seeing right now in LA. Um, exactly. And when I think of your prince, um, and your wolf, he plays two roles, my friends. Yeah. I hope you get paid. Do you get paid double? No. Okay. I get paid. I, they take good, good, good care of me. So it's all okay. Good. Um, yeah, you're in a nice Airbnb, I can see. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you are, I mean, I think about the two people you just mentioned, Christian and Andrew, and, and people we think of as like comedically scientists in that yeah. way. Yeah. Um, you, I mean, okay. Come on. I, I, feel, I feel I feel I understand it now more and more. Yes. And, and I look forward to doing more if I keep acting and stuff to do more roles where I can sort of experiment with that, but also dramatic roles if they come along. Finding the funny in the drama and the drama and the funny is always. Yeah. Fun. I think what makes 
we, you know, what makes something funny is how seriously people go at the thing. And you're like, what are you doing? And I that's know. what I love playing in the prince and, and the wolf, but especially the prince is I, I always envisioned my take on the character is when the royal family comes through, everybody right before they walk on stage is like, oh, God, here they come again. Your Highness. And then when yeah. they leave, they're like, that guy's such a dick Ugh, bag. I hate him. But, yeah. Yes, exactly. But I kind such of Such a dick have, bag. I have I have no <laughs> no idea that anyone would yes. possibly think of me as ever the greatest thing ever. And that's what's fun to play. Yeah. 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 Well, it first of all, I don't know if you're like me, but into the woods, I can picture the um like the the C D that I ordered oh, and yeah. the book inside the CD case um, and studying it. I mean, I'm old enough to have begun with holding albums in my hand and, and yeah. taking the record out because um, I'm a grandma now, but I'm for kids you. at home, but mm -hmm. that booklet that came with Into the Woods and just, and being someone who got to see it, um, what a touchstone, right? For like so many of us who fell in love with musical theater and, and musical theater performers. And you, I don't know if you're aware, you're in it. You're in it. You're in Into the Woods, right? Oh, oh, like yeah. you're, I thought, I, yes. I thought, I thought, no, no, no. Yeah. You're in submissions only and you're also in the original production of Into the Woods with you are Chip Zion. No, like, yeah. like yeah. how heady. It's a pinch me moment for sure. I, I remember for me, it was the CD in, in high school that I got from the library. And I remember reading it and looking at the pictures and seeing the calligraphy kind of writing of yeah. it. And, the, and then listening to, I remember listening to Agony and going, this is a great song. And, yeah. and, and never once thinking I'd be performing it. I did, I played the baker in, high, in college for a student production that was really fun. Yeah. And then with this, I remember being in, I was at a writing retreat for Walk On Through and in Florida at the amazing Hermitage Artist Retreat in Englewood. And I was walking on the beach every day while I was ideating. And I was like, I'm about to start rehearsals for Into the Woods when I get back. I should probably start listening to this original Broadway cast recording. And it was, sure. it was, that, it was that, it was bringing all these memories back, not only of, of the show and what I love about the show, but who I was when I heard it. You know, you know when you listen to something and you're immediately back to that heartbreak or that senior year or, or whatever it is, it's just so, it's so neat to, to be, that, that something artistic, that somebody thought of, an idea that Sondheim and Lapine had can be so ingrained in our DNA. And that's why I think the show is succeeding like it is now in such a beautiful way. I remember having James Lapine. I have another podcast called And the Award Goes To, which you could also be on because it's Tony winners. And huh. we start where like my guests listen back to their speech, some of whom have never heard it like since the night. And for you, your Tony is more recent. So it won't be as like, oh my God, I have no memory of it. But for like James, it was a really, it was a long time ago. And mm -hmm. I could not believe how humble and sweet and regular Joe James Lapine is as a person. Like there was something so, I was so reverential. Like, of course, the entire time, I'm like, oh, this is the man who wrote the Bible. Like, that's incredible. But he's just like, he's so accessible and warm and lovely and funny and honest about his relationship with Steve and, and where he wanted it to be and where it was at the end, sort of all of the real relationship stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I'm assuming he was around and uh, a valuable resource for you guys. Can you talk a little bit about hanging with, with Jimmy? Yeah, I, I will say one of the one of the great memories of was the very first day we had the circle up, you know, at the beginning when you're doing a show, when they say we're going to do the introduce every, everybody and you all stand in a huge circle in the rehearsal room and they go around and say, I'm Gavin Creel, my pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm playing the, bull, the wolf and the baker, or the wolf and the baker, the wolf and the Cinderella's prince. And then the next person is, you know, I'm James Lapine, I'm the writer, and I, you know, pronouns are blah, blah. And he had a space next to him that it just happened to happen. It wasn't like organically. Happened. Yes, there was right. like a little bit of a space, probably because people are like, that's James Lapine, I don't understand. Him. <laughs> and he said, exactly. it's bizarre that there's a space next to me and also perfect because this would be where Steve would be standing. Oh my God. It was, it was, this was the first professional production since Steve's passing. 
of one of his shows. It feels bittersweet that we're here to do this show, but also very sad and painful that he's not here. And that was a really amazing moment. But, but he would just be, he'd check in once in a while, he'd put a couple notes on the call board. We had a rehearsal before the tour where he came in and sort of upset the apple cart in a way that was really a little alarming and disturbing to us. And then he apologized for it because he was like, I'm sorry, I came in with my director hat on and not my writer hat. He was supposed to observe. And, and we were able to get back to the things that we found with his piece because he was looking at going, I would have done it differently. Of course you would have because you have different visions. But Lear and our team had uh, visions for this production and it's succeeding in a way that's speaking to people in a new way, in a different way. So that was really, but also at the same time, no matter what he was saying, I was kind of like, our cast, it was sh it shook us a little bit because you're, you, it is the Bible. You're like, this is God. Yeah. And, and I want God to be up. pleased. Yes. Exactly. Oh and and what was neat is at the end of it, you were sort of like, how cool. Even the person who wrote it can have opinions about something. Right. They don't have to be the gospel. At the moment, the gospel is what we have found together. And I right. love that, you know. Yeah, but I can also imagine going home and crying. Uh, uh, so, so both things, both things can yeah. live at the same time. But you were on the other side of it, and absolutely, like I, I feel like there are very few. Okay, so you go to the share show, or you go to MJ, and you go to certain shows that are meant to be. Like, oh my God, am I actually now at a Michael Jackson concert? This is bizarre. Or am I at a share concert, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's so, and people, you expect them to go insane because they recognize song after song after song. And they mm -hmm. are people who don't even generally go to Broadway shows. They're going because it's about share or it's about Into the Woods, which is a Sondheim Lapine musical about unbelievably deep dark serious themes with unbelievably catchy songs with the most insane brilliant lyrics people were freaking out yeah. I, I i was literally like what's happening it's i'm still what's like happening? that it's happening at the amundsen in la our opening night they stood up at the beginning they stood up in the middle of songs i think it's exactly what you said they go see Cher because they know all the songs and they sure and, and it's seeing Cher in a new place. You're actually seeing Sondheim in a new way, but in the place where he belongs, Lapine where he belongs in this show that you fell in love with that there's almost a 40 year history now of with the show. Right. So we stand up and they're like, that's that's it takes two. There's Milky White. It's it's iconic. Yeah. And, it, and, the, and I like what I love about our production is it's really simple. It's just it's putting the orchestra on stage, the music front and center. It's really intimate. It's oddly yeah. intimate for a big musical with so many cast members. Yeah. And and yeah, it really transferred sort of seamlessly from encores. Okay. All right. Listen, yeah. you guys, there are so many incredible interviews with Gavin about Into the Woods and about all the shows. But can I just tell you what I want to talk about in the short time I have you today? Because you do have two shows. OK, so walk on through from what I understand uh, has to do with the Metropolitan Museum of Art and you, Gavin Creel. Yes. Um, and I, I want to know everything that you care to share I'm, I'm so honored about to it. to talk about this because I believe in it so much. I'm so okay. excited. Okay, so you're good to talk about it. Everything, yes. You're we, fine, we finally, okay. We, anou we announced the show. It's going to be at MCC starting in November. We'll do a limited run, and if we can, we'll get an extension or two if, if people come. It's. I'm so honored, first of all, to get the show selected by Bernie and Will and Scott. I and love those Ayana guys, yeah. At MCC. Um, it's such a great theater and I've been such a fan of the stuff they've been making over there on the west side. I just want to explain to folks at home. So MCC is Manhattan Class Company. And when you say Bernie, like so many people know Bernie Telsey as, and Will Cantler and all those guys as like the kind of gatekeepers of Broadway casting and HBO series. Like they have, they're like yeah. huge casting directors. Huge. Um, but early days with Bobby Lapone, who we lost recently, yeah. Patty Lapone's brother, um, Bernie and Bobby and Will started a theater, like a glorious institution now of New York 
theater, supporting new work. So I just want people to understand, like, it's the same Bernie that you, like, are dying to get in to see for every role. Yes. Um, yeah. He is a theater nerd of all theater nerds and loves yep. new work. So I'm just sorry about that aside. I just want to explain no, to people who so they good. are. It's so good to remind people that the business is sort of in bed with itself in the way, but not in a way that's, well, in some ways that are unhealthy, but Bernie is a theater nerd like you and I are and, and loves the theater so much. Started that very simple early and it's grown over the past almost 30 years, I think or 20 or 30 years. Um, and now they have this beautiful campus over on 52nd, 53rd Street between 10th it's and 11th. It's wild, yeah, yeah beautiful, really beautiful theaters. But the, the, the short story about Walk On Through is I was um, approached by a friend of mine who I met 18 years ago and said, um, I work at the Met now and would you, I, there's these, this curatorial department called the Met Live Arts Series, which is run, by, at the time was run by, still is run by Limor Tomer and was at the time by Aaron Flannery. And these two women said, we'd love to take a meeting with Gavin to talk about the possibility of collaborating. And I was like, huh? And, and the truth is I'd never been to the Met before. And I'd been in New York for 20 years and I was embarrassed no. to take the meeting. What do you yeah, mean? I just am not, wasn't a not meeting a in person. Yeah, I just was just like overwhelmed. There's, and it's in the show. That's what the show sort of, it's called. Okay. Walk on through Confessions of a Museum Novice. And it's basically, they had me in. I sat down, had tea with them in this beautiful room above the Egyptian art section and they basically just said, what we do is we are one of the only performance based, maybe the only performance based cult, uh, curatorial department in a major art a museum institution that collaborates with singers, dancers, choreographers, directors, musicians, opera singer, you know, uh, performance artists. And what we do is we give you a membership card and then we say, go, be free in the museum for as long as you need. And once you are inspired by something or have an idea about a performance piece, come back and tell us and we'll help you produce it. And they've done hundreds of these concerts over the, over the past years. And some people do them in galleries, some people do them on the main floor, some people do them in, there's a 700 seat theater called the Grace Rainey Rogers Auditorium, which is where I did mine. I didn't even know there was a theater in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. But um, they basically just said, it was, this was in January of 2019, um, let us know. And my idea was I'm a middle-aged man who's having a bit of a midlife breakdown and I have no idea what I'm doing here. I've never been here and I don't know what I'm doing. And it's kind of like how I felt in my life. I've had this amazing life, but I was in a kind of a rough place and going through some stuff. And I just said, I can only tell that story, which is the truth. And what am I, what, where the opening thing you'll hear it repeats throughout the show is where am I in this place? Who am I meant to be in this world, in this space? Can I find me? And that's basically the show is like, I don't belong here. And I feel like I don't belong in my body and in my life at the moment. I've had this awesome life as an actor so far, but I just feel lost. And I feel lost in this building. And over the course of about 100 minutes, through a bunch of different, maybe like 30 pieces of art, I sort of go on a journey walking on through to try to find answers for myself and for purpose and for meaning. And, and along the way comes beginnings, loss, loneliness, love, um, and just life, really. And it's, I'm so proud of it. I can't tell oh. you how excited I am to share it with everybody. And we have an amazing team that's putting it together and, and some commercial producers, Jenny Gersten and, and Nikai Bay and uh, Kevin Ryan and Devin Cudell and Aaron Flannery. Like we have this amazing team of people that are working together to try to bring it to a commercial theater after this. And, and then I want to tour it around the world. As I said in the bio read, the globe. Mm -hmm. um, okay, first of all, okay. I think it would be astonishing for people who are fans of yours or people who just aspire to reach a certain level of success in whatever profession they are pursuing. To hear that someone who, to the outside eye, not an intimate friend of yours, would go, this guy has built a career where he has choices, which is rare for a lot of performers, mm -hmm. um, has managed to take care of his voice and 
body and God-given gifts and take these God-given gifts and really respect them and hone the craft and work on them and treat them like the gift that they are. And the idea that you would find yourself, as you've just described, sort of feeling so uncertain about your place on the planet at that moment in time is so, I mean, A, I go, oof, what am I, <laughs> if, Gavin oh. Creel, if Gavin Creel isn't feeling good. Um, can you talk a little bit, I mean, I know it sounds to me like you are a very open person in your work, especially this piece about, about your truths and your yeah. pain, right? Yeah. Is that yeah. scary? It was at the beginning of it. And now I don't, with this piece anyway, it's the only way I can, the piece will succeed is if I just kind of crack myself wider. I was lucky enough to get into the O'Neill Festival last summer. Uh -huh. and Alex Gemignani, who's a friend, but also an incredible leader up there in one of our note sessions where like nine people around are all up their notes and saying, we need you to look at this. We need you. To... And I was like, Ugh. I didn't know if I could do it. And I can do right. it, but it's hard. Yeah. And he said, we want to see the artwork on you. Like I was doing, I was talking about other people or other stories. And he goes, it's great. But when you tell us what's going on with you, what the art right. does to you, it becomes more personal. And therefore, as you know, I learned through writing and through is more universal. The more specific yeah. and the more pinpoint it is to me, the more then you're like, I know that feeling. And you're like, I always bring up the eight, six, seven, five, three, oh, nine. Yeah. That's probably a very specific phone, someone's phone number. Yeah. But to me, I'm like totally four, three, two, four, two, three, three, two, oh, seven. Like I know yeah. I memorized the, the, my, my, the crush's phone number and whatever that is. It's the more specific I get, the more vulnerable and open I can be and the more universal it becomes. And, and I, I'd have to tell you the other day, yesterday, I got a beautiful note from one of our producers and he was making observations about the piece and he just said, it's just so vulnerable and, and open. And I, and I wrote back and I said, I am so excited that we are going to make this piece together because I'm hoping my greatest hope is that you will see it and you will do two things. One, you will want to make something. You will want to leave the theater on fire. I just, I want to go write a poem or I want to go write yeah. a song. I want to go write a play. I want to start a 300 episodes of a podcast is something you should be, it's, it's remarkable that you've done this and given that gift to so many people who probably, especially during the pandemic, were lost and what to do and who to count on and you were there for them. And that's, that's to me, you can call it God, Buddha, Mecca, Haini, Ho, whatever you want, but that's God's work to me to be there for people in that way. And I just, Ilana, I'm just amazed that you have stayed with it and it's not been easy, I know. But my hope, my a second hope is that, and I wrote this to the producer, I just want people to feel less alone because I have struggled so badly with loneliness and, and I still do in a way that thanks to meditation is less intense and thanks to self-worth and work, working and therapy is less debilitative, but or debilitating. <clears throat> but I really am excited to be able to share. I'm not hoping I'm able to access the emotions I need to every night in this show because it's new to me to do. I'm playing a character named Gavin Creel. It's I'm Gavin Creel writing about Gavin Creel and I'm performing Gavin Creel. So it's a lot. It's very vulnerable. It's very. Vulnerable. It's so meta. Yeah. yeah. And just meta. so. Meta. <laughs> Wait a minute. Did I make that up? No, I'm gonna, I, I want to do t-shirts with the same met dash. Uh. Thought I made it up. God damn it. Um, <laughs> what is something that you think will really surprise people who know you? Not people who only know you through the work mm -hmm. and love you. What do you think is something that will really surprise the intimate people in your life when they see the show? I think it's what you said. I think it's the, I didn't realize you were hurting like that. Mm -hmm. I think it's that. And, and, and for people who don't know me that well, but see the show, I'm hoping they will see, be able to, because I do think people think, and I'm very aware of my privilege of being a white right. cisgendered man in this business. I happen to be gay as hell, but um, that thank God I'm gay or because it's given me 
a real objectivity and be to be able to look at oh wow I'm very I'm very othered and very different and right right big, large portions of the world and I'm always sort of guard up and people are always like oh you seem so comfortable in my skin I'm like cool I've worked really hard to do that but sure. every day I leave every moment I leave the house I'm on a slightly on guard about where is danger where could I be abused huh. where could I be yep. made fun of you know but the other of the course other thing, I think the other thing that people who don't know me is I didn't know you could write music like that I'm really excited to share that my writing like and I I'm yeah I, I'm just I can't wait for you to come I hope you'll come and and of yeah. course I will come. Yeah. Um, and I think I'm going to have a lot of opportunities to see it, which is thrilling. I was thinking so much about, you know, I have a lot of friends who are gay, who are writing for musical theater, and I see their beautiful pieces. And it is still, for the most part, about heterosexual couples at the center of it. Like, like even my out glorious, beautiful writer friends. Mm -hmm. And I think so much about like, I mean, I know there's commerce, like Broadway is commerce driven. And so I understand why there's this idea that most people will relate to a certain kind of love story or tragedy, like whatever the story is. But I'm so excited that you are doing a show where you play Gavin Creel mm -hmm. because Gavin Creel is a beautiful artist who, as he describes it, is gay as hell. Yes. And not just gay, <laughs> gay, gay, as, gay hell. as hell. And I can't wait <laughs> to see what that means. Um, and that and that not only are you writing this musical about what it is to be human, and and I think post-pandemic, we are all trying to hold on to this feeling of how much we wanted to connect, but to keep that going, like, okay, but now we're all back to Snapchat and back, like, like to, yes, like, I, I feel so lucky because I have created um, a job for myself that absolutely assures me that multiple times a week, I, even if it's on Zoom, and sometimes it's in my studio, like if you were here in New York, um, I get to look in someone's eyes and have real conversations. And mm -hmm. that was so important to me in my life that I created a, a job for myself that would guarantee connection. that connection. Because when you're in a play and you're in a dressing room um, or just in a green room or like you're constantly bumping up against other people, whether you want to or not, but it demands that you talk to each other. And we were, that was kept from us for a really long time. And now that we're back, I sort of demand that people continue to be in, in long form conversations. And, yeah. and I feel so lucky to have this moment with you right now. I mean, we've texted a fair amount and it's so fun and you really are so funny and it just makes me Likewise. so happy. But um, this means the world to me. So for now, you know, this podcast, they they're evergreen. They, they go on forever, but let's just get very specific about date and time. The first performance of your show is where and when? It will be at the Manhattan Class Company, MCC Theater, I believe on or around November 14th. Of 2023. 2023. And okay. we will run hopefully... It will hopefully will extend and extend again, but I think they're selling the first four weeks. Uh, okay. And then hopefully we'll get an extension or two. We'll see. We'll see how okay. we're in. So people in can go to that website, the yeah, MCC. So, yep. They haven't started selling tickets yet. The tickets will go on sale probably this fall at some point. They are, we're, there's two theaters there. There's a 300 seat theater, which is where I originally wanted to do it. And they said, will you trust us on this? Shrink it down. Let's put it in the Frankel, which is a black box. I mm. walked into the space and I was like, oh, this is going to be really creative and fun. We're literally, you're basically in the show. You're sitting, yeah, I don't, there's not audience interaction, but like you are a part of this gallery exhibit. Of yeah, Walk on we're right there with you. Yeah, yeah. And I I want to say one thing real quick before we go about about what you said about uh, out performers writing or out writers writing about for uh, straight characters. I'm going to continue to try to write for the rest of my career and I'm only going to write queer stories. Because of that reason, I, I yeah. know commercial viability is weighs heavily on you spend a lot of time and money and effort, you, 
it's a sad truth that you feel that there isn't an audience. People ultimately don't see themselves in the story, so they don't want to go, or there's homophobia or whatever the biases that may come about. It is a funny thing to be in such a gay, friendly um, institution and so few musicals mm -hmm. center stage are gay men in the center of the story. And I yeah. want to be a part, a part of changing that. And the first character I'm going to play is myself. But I, I'm excited by, I've been le reading a lot of queer literature lately, and I'm excited by allowing, giving myself permission to trust that those stories are viable and worthwhile. And I will say, I had a, an a possible investor ask me, very vulnerably, and I appreciated their vulnerability, even if the, the question seemed a bit gauche. Right. They said, can I ask one last question? Is It's very gay. There's the gay, the gay part of Walk On Through. Are you worried about it? Like, are we going to cast it? Will the net be cast as wide as it could possibly be cast? And I said, it is my truth. Right. So it is for me. I, I said there I deliberately I love to curse, mm -hmm. but I deliberately did not put one curse word in the show. Once in a while, I'll ad lib a shit here and there, which I'm going to try not to do because I deliberately wanted to, there's no cursing because people get really precious about cursing. There's no um, overt sexual um, act. There's no um, inappropriate sensual sexual behavior. There is a song that really comes for sexual shame in, that I'm really proud of called Hands on You, which is basically about all the statues that I want to fuck in the museum. Um, and it's a really joyful, like, rebellion against, like, sexual shame. Yeah. It goes back into my past and examines where it all came from, of me being shameful of myself. And, you know, where I hid who I was. Right. But other than that, it's just about me being gay. And if there is a problem of commercial viability about me being gay, that is a problem that society has, not me. Right, you know? right, I don't, right. I don't curse. I don't do anything inappropriate. And the fact that you think my being, my truth, who I am, is like cursing or inappropriate sexual behavior or whatever, that's, that's theirs to sort out. And I, that's right. hope that, I hope that I get to play this everywhere. So people everywhere, even the people I don't identify with or think that I'm going to go to hell for being gay, will come see Walk On Through and see themselves in the art and... I may not be a gay, white, cisgendered, middle-aged man who's having a bit of a midlife moment, but I do know what it's like to feel othered. I do know what it's like to feel sad. I need to feel lonely, to want to have yeah. love and to be heartbroken. That's And to be lost in a space that everybody else seems smarter than me, more cultured than me, understand what to look for, and don't feel that interesting. I don't feel that interesting, and yet... I hope when you see the show, you'll go, wow, you're extremely interesting. And I hope you believe me when I say inside this body, this mind, I don't feel that interesting at all. Yet this is what I saw when I walked on through the museum and, and in my life. And I'm hoping people feel less alone and free, even if they're a MAGA hat wearing, gun toting, which are people that I don't oftentimes really understand or identify with. Right. We are all one human race. And even if you've got a flag in the back of your car that says horrible things, somewhere deep down, you and I are the same person and we can't keep dividing. So I'm hoping the show shows I'm scared and I'm lonely and I'm gay and I am trying to figure my life out. I think you with that flag in the back of your truck, you're feeling the same things. What if we're more alike than we are different? I don't know. Okay, well, first of all, I think about... Um, all of the things that make you so special. And maybe in some way, it's a little bit good that you are not quite aware of how special you are because you have so much humility and maybe you'd just be a monster if you knew how fucking amazing you are. So, so kind. So I'm just saying, I'm just saying, you know, I'm just saying I, I, there's a lot for, I have so much I want to say and I'm thinking about so much, but I guess that is why your work is so rich and beautiful because you, you don't lead with um, self grandness or self, um, What's the word I'm looking for? 
uh, I don't know, you just lead with humility. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Um, I, I want you to, you know, I wish for everyone I love that they have self-love, which is very different than ego and pompousness and things that we all find really repellent in, in a dinner party mate. Uh, and you are the opposite of all those things. But, but if any of this journey helps lead you deeper to self-love and acceptance, uh, that is my wish for you because you deserve it, obviously. Um, I'm going to make you do this thing, even though you've revealed so much already and have been so generous. But before Wait, you go do two wrap, shows, can I, this can is I to wrap it up. Okay, yes. Can I say one thing to you? Yeah. It's so obvious. I've done a lot of these things. I've done a lot of tons of interviews as we do in this industry. And I've been sure. lucky enough to be asked to be on a bunch of different podcasts. I have to tell you. What just happened in the last 45 minutes is such a testament to your interviewing ability and your listening. I'm trying to be a better active listener and you are impeccable at it, Ilana. Like, it's so clear that you have been in practice. You have been in process mm -hmm. and practice of this because most of the time people are, you don't, you're so off the cuff, but you're listening and you're, you uplifted me throughout this entire interview in a way that I hope people who listen are able to listen to you listening. So when you were talking, a lot of times people will talk and they will steal away and they'll go off on it. You were talking about things that we were talking about that then dump back into stuff that are I'm thinking about, which is such an, a testament to your, I hope you continue to do this and get syndication and, and have a TV show or, you know, because you're so good at it. Really, really great. Yeah, then. I mean, thank it. you. I really yeah. appreciate that. That means the world to me because you are someone I admire so much. So thank you. Uh, thank you. All How right. Do How do we wrap? We are wrapping it up with, uh, can you share a little known fact about you? Um, a little known fact. The first one that pops to mind is that I can do this. That's me making armpit noises. I can do it every single time. I learned from Joey Lamb in the third grade in the back of Mrs. Kidwell's class. And I'm gonna tell you what, I got in a little bit of trouble, but I have never stopped doing that with my armpit. <laughs> and when I say what a brilliant artist you are, that my friend <laughs> is what I'm talking about. Um, all right, go do your shows. We don't know what the traffic's gonna be. Right. So give yourself plenty of time time um yeah. say hello to your glorious cast i'll see you when you get back to new york thanks alana i'll see you soon yes. bye bye bye, -bye.